Good morning, upper room and guests. Amen. Are you ready for a word from God this morning? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Before I get started, I just want to make a couple of acknowledgments. First of all, as y'all know, I love to shout out my wife. Amen. The beautiful, the lovely, the virtuous, the fine, and all mine. Hallelujah. Mrs. Corita Parks. Amen. Hallelujah. I thank God for that woman of God right there. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want to shout out, amen, the birthday girl this morning. Amen. Our first lady. Amen. First lady, Almeida Rafford. Amen. I think, I think if you pass the mic around the entire congregation, you would get a different story about first lady, Almeida Rafford. Amen. I know for me, I, I remember when I was a, a deacon in training, um, she was hard on me, y'all. I mean, really hard on me. And, you know, the thing about it is I started to notice she wasn't as hard on everybody else than she was on me. Amen. <laughs> but then I came, I came to understand uh, later on was as a young leader, I had very thin skin. And uh, I think First Lady recognized that and let me tell you something. If, if you got thin skin in ministry, you ain't going to make it. <laughs> you will not. So she toughened me up. Amen. And gave me the confidence to, to stand and know the truth of God. And I can stand in front of folks and know that I was speaking with conviction because I was speaking from a place of truth. Amen. And I thank God for her. Amen. I thank God for her. And she can talk basketball with me like she one of the fellas. Amen. I love First Lady. I'll meet her ever. Happy birthday, First Lady. Amen. I also want to shout out her husband. Amen. My mentor, the, the leader of this house. Amen. Pastor Jesse L. Rafford III. Amen. I thank God for him every single day. Amen. So let's get into this word. Amen. We're going to be starting a series today. I have no idea how many parts of this series is going to be, but God said, let's, let's, let's start at the beginning and I'll tell you where to go next once we're finished with this. Amen. So the title of this series is called Greater Than. Greater Than. Amen. And we're going to be talking about some subjects. God is saying in this season, we need to reorder the things that we've made more important than him. So in part one of this series is entitled, Knowing is Greater Than Thinking. Amen. Knowing is greater than thinking. I know this sounds elementary, my dear Watson, but I need to tell you a lot of us rely so much more on our thinking rather than the truth that is in the scripture that we know. So turn with me into your Bibles to the book of Job, the book of Job chapter one, and I'll be reading verses one through five. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Amen. I'll be reading the King James Version. And the text reads, Job 1, 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and excused evil. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of the feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Let us look to the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We ask, oh God, that you just bless, Lord God, this transaction right now, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that the effect of this word coming forth right now would charge us 
It would challenge us, and it would change us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Knowing is greater than thinking. There are many of us who are quite familiar with the story of Job. One of the things when I was growing up that would bother me, uh, and honestly, as a preacher, still makes me cringe a bit, is when preachers say, you know the story. That bothers me when preachers say that. Maybe this, I'm splitting hairs here, but it bothers me. Because, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't know the story. And I didn't like when preachers say, you know the story, and I didn't know the story. So one of the things that I was taught as a minister in training, and I'm big on as a minister now, is that I never assume that you know. With that being said, I'm not going to tell the entirety of this story of Job, uh, but I want to hit some vital parts. If you want the entire story, go to where the entire story is at, and it's the book of Job, and you can know it for yourself. Uh, I want to pick up here. I know I read verses 1 through 5, but I want to pick up in verse 6 in chapter 1. In this verse, we are brought into a conversation between Satan and God. How intriguing is this? It's so intriguing. God is having a conversation with Satan. Let, let me just stop right here. Let, see, this isn't even on my notes. I want to talk to the people right now who are not sure if God hears you. You're not sure if he heard your prayer. You're not sure if he hears your cry. Let me tell you something. If God will hear Satan... He will hear you. Some, somebody didn't hear me. If God will hear Satan, he will hear you. He heard your cry. He hears when, when you pray. He heard when, when you cry out, when you're fasting and praying. If God will hear Satan, trust me, he will hear you. Amen. After all of these years, I'm I'm. St I still find it remarkable that God and Satan were conversing about Job. It's so intriguing. Listen, they were conversing about Job. Job was living his best life. Job was doing it. All the while, Satan was trying to figure out a way to get in through God's protection. What I found very interesting within this conversation that God was having with Satan is in verses 6 through 12 of chapter 1. God asked Satan a question. Have you considered my servant Job? This question is so intriguing. Now, I've, I've said this on, on occasion, and uh, pastor said this last week, that if as a parent, if you ask your kids a question, they already know the answer. So God already knew everything from beginning to end. He's the alpha and, and he's the omega. And he was at this point right here. And he asked Satan a question. Have you considered my servant Job? This question says to me that Satan didn't even consider Job before this question. Are there areas in your life that Satan won't even consider attacking? Pausing for effect. These areas that Satan doesn't even consider attacking, these areas in your life are what you know. Satan doesn't, didn't consider Job because Job knew too much about God to even attempt an attack. Think about that. He didn't even attempt Job because he knew Job knew too much about God to even try him. Think about, think about right now the areas you don't get attacked in. Think about it. The areas that Satan doesn't even try you. Think about it. Think about the areas that Satan won't even attempt an attack. Those areas in your life are what you know about God. You see, one of the mistakes we make is that when we get an attack 
from Satan. We think everything is under attack. And that's just simply not true. It's not true. It's not true at all. I cringe when I hear believers say all hell is breaking loose because that's not true. It's not true. And I got scripture for that. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Mm. Listen, every, just because you're under attack does not mean everything's under attack. Not to say that you will never get attacked in what we know, but what we know is our strength. What we know to be true about God is our strength. In our strength, we're ready. You're always ready at your strength. We, re we can recognize the enemy immediately in our strength. In our strength, we know exactly what scripture to go to to combat what is coming against us without even have to look for it. In our strength, at a moment's notice, we will fast and pray. In our strength. In our strength, we will worship God to feel his presence. In our strength. What we know is our strength. We are at our strongest with what we know about God. That's where we're strongest. That's where the enemy won't even attempt an attack because he know, he know right away you're going to combat it and it's not even worth his time. The Bible says, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So I want to break this text down a little bit because it, it, it can get a little bit misunderstood and, and, and misapplied. Uh, the word know in this text, the context of that word know, means to be intimate. It means intimacy, to be intimate with my word, meaning exposing every bit of yourself to this word. And the confusion with, within this text is, you know, n just the word no does not mean that you're free within itself. Just knowing something does not mean you're free. Uh, because, and let me explain this a little bit, because there are people who are intimate with foolishness. There are people who know foolishness very well to the point that they expose every bit of themselves to foolishness. There are some who are intimate with lies. Yeah, they expose every bit of themselves to a lie. Knowing in itself is not, does not make you free. We are free by knowing, being intimate with the truth, which is the scripture. Not the truth as you see it. Not your personal interpretation of the truth. Not what you believe. But the only truth that is the word of God. That is what makes us free. Knowing the truth that is in the word of God is where we find clarity, where we find comfort, where we find peace, where we find purpose. That is where the truth is. Nowhere else. Just because you stamp something truth, don't make it truth. Amen. Many of us are not in this space because instead of knowing, we have bought we have brought thinking into the equation. That, that's, that's what's happened. A lot of us aren't as intimate with God as we should be because thinking comes into the equation. Mm -hmm. Most of the stress that we experience in our lives can be directly linked 
to what we think about. What are you saying, Elder? Some of us are just flat out thinking way too much. You're thinking too much. You're thinking too much into it. You know, sometimes we can think ourselves into oblivion. We can. We can utterly destroy every single thing that is connected to us by thinking way too much. We spend so much time thinking about what we don't understand. Some of us think so much that we have trouble sleeping. Some of us don't eat. Some of us have shut down our lives completely because we're thinking way too much. Listen, you got to shut down your life to think. You're thinking too much. Thinking can be endless and dangerous. It's endless because when, when, we, when we think, we're looking for understanding within ourselves. Some of us have been thinking about something for years because we are looking for a place where understanding for that thing is not. Does, does that even make sense? We're, we're trying to find an answer to something in a place where the answer is not. Think about it. We try to wrap our minds around it. And our minds just spin it, spin it, and spin it. We try to wrap our minds around things that we don't understand to the point we become frustrated. And that's when thinking becomes dangerous. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, it says the heart is deceitful. Above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? Have you ever in your life, and I want to explain this text a little bit, have you ever went to someone with a question about anything, and uh, while they were speaking the answer back to you, something just registered in, in your mind, this person don't have no idea what they're talking about. They don't got a clue. But instead of saying, I don't know, they, get, they attempt to give you an answer to make it appear that they know what they're talking about. But you know in your mind, this dude don't know what they're talking about. She don't know what she's saying. I may not know the answer, but I know that ain't it. This is what our heart will do to us. When we try to find an answer within our own heart, our heart will give us an answer, and our heart don't know what it's talking about. That's what it will do. But the thing about it is, because it's our heart, our heart will tell it to us in a way that appears that it makes sense. Yeah, our heart will do that too. Our heart don't know what it's talking about, and yet, Try to counsel us. Your, you can't go to your heart for counsel. The text says that our heart is desperately wicked. Would you go to somebody who is desperately wicked for counsel, for advice? Preach on Elder Chris. Yeah, thinking can also be dangerous when we outsource our thinking. Have you ever outsourced your thinking before? Meaning, have you ever asked someone else what they thought about a situation? This can be dangerous because what we do is we, we will compile someone else's thinking with our own. So what you've done is you have incorporated two deceitful hearts that are desperately wicked. Two. Two. You're asking for a disaster. Because not only do you have one heart that's desperately wicked, you got two. Oh, I would do that too. 
then you got two desperately wicked hearts that have just co-signed your disaster. That's a recipe for disaster. Listen, I don't want anyone to get the idea that thinking about something is wrong. I'm not implying that at all. You know, sometimes we have to think things through. Sometimes we have to reach out to someone who will tell you the truth and won't co-sign your misery. Thinking in itself is not wrong, but thinking that leads to worry or thinking being how we make decisions is what we must avoid at all costs. This is what Job did in chapter 1. This is exactly what Job did. Job's line of thinking led him to worry, which caused him to make a decision that was worry-based. Look at it, Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, verse 5, and it says, And it was so when the days of the feasting were gone about that Job sent and, and, sac- and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now listen, I don't know what evidence Job had. I I, I don't know. I don't know what made Job think this in his mind to make a sacrifice on something that he thought was happening. I, I don't know. But what I do know is Job brought his heart into the equation because he did something based on what he was thinking about. Here's a simple truth for you. I got one for you free of charge today. Simple truth. We think about what we don't know about. Yeah, that's what we do. We think about the things we don't know. And I, listen, I'll give you an example. When, I, when I'm driving home from work and, and I'm on my way home, it never comes into my head, is my wife fine? That's just something I don't think <laughs> because I already know that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I know this. <laughs> I don't think about the things I know. And we're the same way. Do you, do you ever spend time thinking about, am I going to have food to eat today? Some people do. But God will provide. That is what we do know. God provides in a way that we could never provide for ourselves, and we know that to be true. This is what Job did. Job made sacrifices based on what he thought might be happening. Come on now. Have you ever made a decision based on what you thought might be happening? You don't know, but you think. I, I know some people who threw away relationships based on something they thought was happening. All right, preach on, hell to Chris. Job made sacrifices based on what he thought might be happening. You know, there are some commentaries that say that Job himself opened the door to Satan by taking action that was based on worry interesting now listen as a father I understand Job's line of thinking I get it I understand what Job was doing you know sometimes we can project what we did on our kids we can do that I don't know if this was for sure but it could be possible that Job himself cursed God when he was their age. And he kept it to himself. Yeah. We go off when, our, when, when the babies start dancing because we used to drop it like it was hot. All right. All right. 
yeah. <laughs> As a father, I, I get Job's line of thinking. I get it. But as a man of God, he made a terrible mistake here. Terrible mistake. By, by taking action on something that he thought and did not know. Think about it. If someone, if someone asks you a question and you just say, I don't know, you just keep it moving, right? Just think about within yourself, I don't know, and you move forward and take action. As a father, I get it. So how do we combat thinking? How do we combat thinking? How do we combat not exalting thinking above knowing the truth that is in the scripture? How do we combat that? It's not complicated, really. I got two things for you, and I'll get out of your way. Two things, what we can do to combat thinking. Number one. Know the things that God wants you to know. Know the things that God wants you to know. You know, in my house, uh, one of the things that I do with, with uh, my children is I start stripping away as they get older the I don't knows. And what I'll start to say once they've gone to the next level is I'm not accepting I don't know there anymore. And that's what God will do with us. Everything that God told us or will tell us is something that God wants us to know. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, the word ignorant is interesting because a lot of us will use this text, you know, a little, a little bit out of context because the word ignorant in this text means that it's something that you do know, but you don't apply. That's what, that's what ignorant... Listen, y'all have heard me say this time and time again. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is ignorance. And some of us are trying to act like we don't know something. When God knows, you do know. That's why that whole God knows my heart thing, yes, he does. Yes, he does. We become ignorant when we don't know what God wants us to know. That's when we become ignorant. When we don't look for what God is trying to show us. That's when we become ignorant. What do you not, what do you not know in your life that you're supposed to know? What do you not know that you're supposed to? Know the things that God wants you to know. Listen, I understand that that what is important has become redundant. But we must read the word of God and we must pray because I know for a fact you go into prayer, you go into his word, he is going to speak to you. Sometimes he speaks to us outside of those confines, but I know for a fact that it is truth that you go in his word and he will speak because that is his word. The word is his spoken word. I get it. What's important has become redundant now, but you have to continue reading the word of God. Number two. Number one was know the things that God wants you to know. Number two, trust God with what we may never know. There are some things that while we're here on this earth, we will not know. And us continuing to try to wrap our minds around something that we may not ever understand is a waste of time. In those areas, like I said, it becomes redundant, but we have to trust God. 
What I found interesting when I was reading this text in the book of Job is that we never find out if Job's line of thinking about his sons was correct. We never know. We never find out. It never explains that his sons were cursing God and he was doing the right thing, or if they weren't and he did the wrong thing. We, we never, we, the text does not make that clear. But what we do know is Job made an action that was worry based that according to some commentaries opened up the door for Satan to come in. Yeah. What we know is that Job took action by continually making preemptive sacrifices on the behalf of his sons that they may not even be doing. Now, my Bible scholars out there who know Old Testament law, there was nothing in place at this time for a pre-sin sacrifice. There was nothing at this time to make a sacrifice on the front end. Sacrifices were to be made after the fact. Pastor was telling me uh, yesterday that sometimes we can look at Old Testament law through New Testament eyes and because of the sacrifice of Jesus, yes, Jesus paid the price for every sin that we have committed and will commit, but at this time, Job was out of order. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 9, verse 10, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. You got to keep going after God and trusting him even when you don't know. See, the problem we have is that a lot of us, when we don't know, we shut it down until we do know. And you're costing yourself growth. You're costing yourself intimacy with God. Just because you don't know, don't shut it down. There are some things you don't know, but keep pressing in the areas you do know. Sometimes God will reveal those things to us, and sometimes he won't, and that's okay. The bottom line is we trust God with what we know and believe him and continue to follow him even when we don't know. Knowing is greater than thinking. Amen. I pray you were blessed by this word. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to pray for those who, who are in a place where they have been thinking to the point that is beginning to bleed over into every area of your life. I want to pray for those who, who overanalyze everything. You know, one of the things I love about Pastor is that he, he shares with me the things his mentor shares with him. And he, he told me yesterday, you know, sometimes we can overcomplicate, open up a bag of potato chips. And it's true. We overthink so many things that are really easy. When we start to overanalyzing one thing, that leads to us overanalyzing everything. Just like the scripture we read, Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I want to pray that you be made free this morning. I want to talk to those who are prisoners in their own mind. Listen, God has made us free. God has made 
us free. Them that know the truth, them that know Jesus have been made free. Don't imprison your mind with things that God may, may not want to tell you right now. Because let's be honest, some, sometimes God will just say to me sometimes, you're not ready yet. Yes, I have the answer, but you're not ready for it yet. Because sometimes hindsight is 2020. When we get out of it and God shows us why, oh. Just because you want an answer don't mean you're ready for the answer. Father, we thank you. And we bless you, Lord God, today. I pray for those, Lord God, who, whose, whose minds are spinning, oh God. Seems like endlessly, Lord God, all day, even at night, Lord God. They, they, they're dreaming about the things, Lord God, that they've been thinking about all day long. I pray, Lord God, for those minds to be made free right now in Jesus' name, Lord God. Hallelujah. We call peace to minds right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, that the peace that surpasses all understanding will rest on minds right now, O oh God. I thank you, Lord God, that you would, you would free up those minds, Lord God, to study scripture. Free up those minds, O oh God, to pray earnestly towards you, Lord God, the one who has our answer, O oh God. We thank you, and we love you, Lord God. Have your way. We thank you for freed minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pray that you were blessed. And we'll see you next week. Good morning, church. I've been given the opportunity to present to you today the too good to be true news of Jesus Christ. You know, the misconception about going to heaven is that a lot of people think that if I'm just a good person, then I get to go to heaven. But that's not true at all. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. And the only person who can counteract that wage is the blood of Jesus Christ. So if this is you, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you this opportunity to receive him right here, right now. If this is you, repeat after me. Say, Father, I confess I'm a sinner and my sins deserve death. But I believe Jesus, the Son of God, died for my sins. He rose three days later. I confess with my mouth I believe in my heart. Thank you, God, for saving me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we believe you've been born again. If this is you, reach out to us. Comment below. We want to talk with you and help you in these first initial steps of a brand new life in Christ. God bless you.